Welcome to the Seek 2023 podcast, featuring some of our favorite podcasters, recorded live at the Spoke Street Media booth during Seek 2023 in St. Louis. We hope these give you a glimpse of the energy and passion from the conference and help you in your faith journey. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to this special edition of All Things Catholic. I'm your host, Edward Sree, and we are here live in St. Louis at the Seek 23 Conference. We got 17,000 people here. It has been so awesome being able to go to mass with dozens and dozens of bishops, hundreds and hundreds of priests, and 17,000 young people here in the big dome, the NFL stadium here in St. Louis. This has been amazing. Uh, But today we have a very special guest. Many of you know him from Ascension Presents. You know him as a co-host of the Poco a Poco podcast. It is Father Mark Mary Ames. He is the Director of Communication and the General Almoner for the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. His two great loves are the Eucharist and the confessional. And he has dedicated his life to bringing both to God's people and God's people to both. And we're hearing, we're gonna talk about a book that he's written called Habits for Holiness, Small Steps, for making big spiritual progress. So Father Mark Mary, welcome to the All Things Catholic Show. Dr. Shree, great to be with you and great to be with all you out there too. It is wonderful to have you here on the show. And uh, I know so many of the young people have been blessed by your podcast, your writing and your videos and all, but I wanna hear a little bit about this book, Habits of Holiness. So tell me, first of all, just why did you end up writing this book? Sure, I've been working with Ascension for a few years and we kind of went back and forth on some ideas, and at one point they, they pitched the idea of doing a book on simplicity. So as Franciscans, kind of the, the poverty and the austerity of life or something we're known for. And I was, I was reflecting on it that perhaps maybe there wasn't a whole book on it, but that that was one component of, of our life. And so what the book ended up being is a little bit more of sort of a layout of like what we do as Franciscans, um, but then also proposing them as ways in which the, the laity can do it. And I think why I did that, right, is I think if you look at the world, as young people, especially as parents with young people, is you can kind of, you can see the craziness of the world and it can be sort of intimidating or discouraging. But I think the gift of what God has done with our community is we were founded in 1987 in the South Bronx when it was at one of its lowest. And we went there and we lived this life. And uh, although there was the craziness and the shootings and the gangs and all that stuff going on, we were able to grow in holiness, right? And the Lord was able to to transform our lives and slowly but surely um, from that also transform others. And so I think that that in it, there's a lot of just really practical tips and and kind of like habits, which uh, the laity, if they can do it, they can follow the Lord wherever they are. I think many of the young people here, especially those on college campuses, they have their own crazy cultures that they're living on, 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 on campus life. And they're here at this conference. They're going to have a profound encounter with the Lord at Mass and in confession and the, the amazing presenters that are here. But when they go back to campus, they're going to need to put this all into practice. And that's why I think this book here could be so helpful for them to, to live out their walk with the Lord Jesus as a disciple in the midst of an environment that isn't that supportive of their Catholic faith. So uh, let's go through some of the points that you talk about. You have different chapters that outline uh, different aspects of different habits that we need to live the Christian life well. The first one is the most foundational one. We talk about it all the time in Focus, but I'd like to hear what you would say about prayer and the importance of daily prayer in your life. Yeah, absolutely. And as you said, and as sort of uh, the tradition of our faith has stated through the centuries, prayer is a non, like prayer is essential. Uh, you, you have to be praying. And actually in the Catechism, uh, saint, one of the saints who is eluding me at this point, St. Alphonse Liguori, it's the, the church uses some very, very strong language when they quote him. He says, uh, those who pray are surely saved and those who do not are surely damned. And there is this sense in which like, it, whether or not we're praying is, is essential and it's, and it's salvific, right? And, and I like, and I use the book, in the book, I use the example of kind of like, a, like that the spiritual life is a real life. And that with, for example, if you had a rose bush or something like that, you, could, you can kill the rose bush by like a violence, by cutting it, by suffocating it, by something like that. Or you can actually, through omission, through just not feeding the rose bush, it'll, it'll slowly but surely die. And I think what, what a lot of us run into as Christians is following the Lord isn't so much at first that we just 
through kind of grave sin and the spiritual life, but actually through omission, particularly when we're going to college, particularly when life gets busy, we just prioritize other things and stop praying. And slowly but surely, uh, the life of grace within us will start to sort of wane and then eventually it can, it can, it can die. Yeah, that's what many of the saints tell us about, uh, you know, turning away from prayer is like cutting off that lifeline with the Lord. And it's what the devil wants to do more than anything else is take a Christian that loves Jesus, loves the Catholic faith, but get them to be too distracted, too busy, put prayer off, not make it a priority. He wants to do everything he can, Catherine of Siena says, to break our habit of prayer. What would you say to a young person that said, okay, well, you know, it was fun to come to this conference and we prayed and we had adoration, it was great, but man, on campus, I'm just too busy. I'm doing 18 hours. I'm involved in all these activities. You know, I'll, I'll fit prayer in when I can, but I don't know if I could get it in every day. What would you say to someone like yeah, that? Yeah, I think it's a great question because I think it's funny how we justify that, that uh, my life is so busy, therefore I shouldn't pray. And I do think it's like, for example, if like, oh, hey, tomorrow I'm gonna go run a marathon, so I don't have time to eat today. And you're like, well, no, 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 because of the activity, because of what you're going to be doing, you actually need even more nourishment. And so I think, uh, you know, with the prayer life, and some doctors of the church have talked about this, actually you saying your life is busy is even more reason for you to pray. And to use kind of a little story is Father Benedict Rochelle, who's one of the founders of our community, was, was tapped by the Archbishop of New York to help Mother Teresa find her first convent in the U.S., and Mother and, and Father Benedict are going back, and it's before our community had started. And, and Mother says to him, you know, Father, you need to make a holy hour every day. And he says, well, Mother, I know that's great, but I just think we're going to be too busy. And she says, well, then you need to make two holy hours. You know, and this is, this is I think this is what, this is the reality, and this is what Mother Teresa understood and why she could live the life she, she could, is the understanding that actually, because of the stresses of life, because of the demands of life, even more, we need we need the strength of God, the grace of God, um, to fill us, to animate us, to go before us. And one other thing on prayer, uh, many young people may feel is like sitting in silence with God is kind of scary. You know, I'm used to having a lot of noise. I'm constantly on my phone. I'm listening to something. Uh, what would you say to somebody who says, "I'll just pray. I'll just like, I'll just listen to a podcast. That'll be my prayer." Or <laughs> uh, I'm afraid to spend that time in silence with the Lord. What would you do to encourage them to really take that quiet time? with Jesus every day? Yeah, I think first is I get it. You know, I remember I, st stuff started to happen in high school. And I remember the first time, my, like essentially my youth minister took me to the chapel and I went in there and I said, our father, a Hail Mary and a glory be. And I was like, like, okay, what, what do I do now? Right. And there, and there is a component of, of time and of learning, you know, and, and certainly the habit or the skill of listening, what listening actually looks like, is something that we want to be taught in. And I think um, what, what I would propose probably is, is beginning with listening, uh, not as just sitting in silence, but actually reading the Word of God. Is, is we don't want to forget the fact that God has spoken and He speaks in His Word and continues to give us access to what He wants to say to us through His Word. And so it's not just go in the chapel without anything, prompt, no prompts, and just sit there for an hour, but maybe go in. Uh, maybe listen to a video, read a book on Lexio Divina, and, and really begin with the scriptures, read it, spend some time with that. That's probably the best kind of first practice of, of listening in prayer. All right, very important. Well, that's just the first habit, and we are here at the Seek Conference. This is a special edition of the All Things Catholic podcast. I'm your host, Edward Street. We have Father Mark Mary Ames here, and we're talking about his book, Habits for Holiness, Small Steps for Making Big Spiritual Progress. And the first step, the first chapter we've been talking about is prayer. In the second chapter, you say the next habit we need to focus on is family. Family, the power of relationship. What do you mean by this? I think a, a couple of things. Um, number one, to use a different word kind of from an, or hit it from a different angle, is discipleship is a team sport. And, and there, we were not meant to follow the Lord on our own. And again, going back to the idea of how were we able to, our, our founders back in 87, how were they able to follow the Lord in the midst of a crazy context? Because they weren't doing it alone, right? And the sheep that gets picked off is the sheep that kind of goes off on its own. And so we really need community. We, we need each other to strengthen us. We need each other to keep us in touch with reality. We can just, we, we, it, it's, again, we, we are made for community and we're made for relationship. And, um, and this is why, you know, God reveals himself to us as father. He gives us Our Lady as a mother. And by baptism, we're actually entering into this, this family. And one component of family, which I think is so important, is um, 
you know, like I have cousins who I didn't grow up with seeing much, seeing very often, but I see them once every six, seven years. But there was a bond that we like held because we're family. And so I think part of this as well is just remembering that by baptism, by grace, by sharing one heavenly father, uh, to use like Mother Teresa's language, like we belong to each other. And, and that means something. And that's going to change the way in which we live and, and, and treat one another. You know, I, just this idea of family is very dear to my heart because my daughter uh, just got married on Friday. So we had the first Sri wedding uh, and it was so beautiful just seeing the family come together with great love around their love for Madeline and Madeline, my daughter, and, and her husband now, Caden. Uh, and then the next day they came over, it was New Year's Eve, they came over to the house for dinner. And some, one of the siblings said, oh, dad, how are you feeling? You lost your daughter. You know, and then, but one of the other siblings says, no, we gained a brother. <laughs> and, and it was so fun that like you saw Caden holding one of the, our, my, my little daughters and saying, I'm your brother now. And it's, it's real, right? And so even I look out here and I see all these people, so many faces I've never seen before. And, and we don't know these people and we're, we're meeting here the first time like this. And, and yet we have a profound bond because of the grace of Jesus Christ within us that unites us truly, you're my brother. Uh, and truly, all these people here are brothers and sisters, and we're all part of the family of God, and the saints in heaven are our brothers and sisters who've gone before us. But what would you say to these young people who are going to be, again, going back to campuses? It's one thing to be here with 17,000 other on-fire Catholics that are there to support and encourage you in your faith. And then you're going to be going back to your fraternity or to your football team or to your dorm where maybe you don't have that support and encouragement, those deeper friendships. What, what encouragement would you give to them? Yeah, I think, and again, to kind of like respond first with the story, I'm from Orange County in California, from Southern California. And I was back home for one summer and a friend of mine who was playing baseball at Oregon at the time was back in town and, and kind of like he started to have his conversion. And it was to the point where he was wondering whether or not he can go back to campus because uh, like the community and the baseball team wasn't super great. He didn't have a lot of friends who were also following the Lord. And he told me this years later, I don't remember saying it, but I'm like, hey, bro, you just got to pray. You just got to ask the Lord to send somebody. And so he ended up going back and he went to mass the very first, uh, whatever Sunday he was there. It was the very first day that focus was on campus. And so he just, he just arrived and focus was just there, literally their very first Sunday. And he got connected with them, ended up becoming a focused missionary, married a focused missionary. And so I do think like number one is to pray for it and to trust that God will provide. And number two, we have to look for it, so to prioritize it, to look for it. Number three, when the invitation is there, the door is open to, to walk through it. But, but especially on a college campus, like in, in, in any situation, we're just not made to do this alone. And life's hard enough. And uh, we really do need uh, community to walk with. Yeah, one of the images we use in Focus a lot is that of burning coals. When you're making a, a, a barbecue, <laughs> you, right. you put all the coals together, right? If you have one coal off to the side, it, it's, it's, it's going to eventually lose its heat. It's going to die. And we don't want our faith life to lose its heat. So we want to intentionally find those other coals. And I think to pray, to beg for it if you don't have that. That's true not only for the college students here, but whether you're a young adult, whether you're married, you have a family life. I, I hear, I meet a lot of couples and families around the country that feel very alone. I'm trying to, we're trying to live our Catholic faith and there's not, I don't know anybody else out there. I feel like I just stand out for them to pray and beg God to bring others in their life. God will, God will hear that cry. Yeah, amen. All right, so we talked about prayer. We talked about the importance of having good friends, family, relationships. But uh, the third point you mentioned is Catholic culture and liturgical living more than patches. What did you mean by that? <laughs> you know, I think, um, right, so it's a, it's a reference to a Frank Sheed quote, who's one of the kind of the great, if you will, spiritual writers of the last century. And he talks about, his quote is, it's not so much that we have, like Christians have, what is it, Cri uh, Christian minds with spiritual, with like worldly patches, but worldly minds with Christian patches. Something along those lines, I, I believe you know the quote. But the idea is that so often we're kind of like everybody else with a few little things that are like Catholic, but really for the most part, we're, we're, we're living lives like everyone else. And, and the, the, the thought is actually like, particularly on the level of culture, on the things we do, the things we celebrate, we want them to be like thoroughly Catholic and almost have this like Catholic marinade where the Catholic values and the Catholic worldview and the Catholic things are what we're kind of steeped in because ultimately these are the things that are going to, to form us. And I think a really good tangible example is if you ask anybody or you look back on your life, your memories of Halloween versus All Saints Day, right? Because they're right next to each other. 
And, uh, and in some ways, if you will, for the liturgical calendar and like the worldly calendar, they're kind of on equivalent levels of festivity, is almost none of us have any memories of All Saints Day. And all of us have a lot of memories of, of Halloween. And it's like, okay, why is that? Because for Halloween, we did something. We got dressed up. We, we had special food. We had a little special kind of custom with our family. Uh, we had culture for it. And for All Saints Day, we had nothing, right? And so the impact of that is that Halloween's going to leave a deep impact on us or an impact on us, and All Saints Day isn't. And so this is just kind of the things. Uh, we, we have to celebrate the things of the church, have this sort of culture, because uh, we're going to celebrate something. And so whether or not what impacts us, right, is, is Halloween or football or what, this or that, or the stuff of the faith, uh, it's going to be kind of where we, what we celebrate. In the book, you mentioned different times in your life, whether it's having a weekly thing, something once a month, yeah. uh, living the liturgical seasons. What would be some practical things, again, you would give to people to say, okay, I want to live more as a Catholic, truly as a Catholic in this yeah. world. What are some things that I could do? Like All Saints Day is one example. What would be something else? Yeah, super easy, right? And, and we don't have to make this up. Uh, Sunday is, is the day of the Lord. And to celebrate Sunday and to rest on Sunday and to feast on Sunday and to like have some ice cream on Sunday. Like all of this sort of stuff uh, is like, that's like the starting point is like Sunday is a special day. And the more we celebrate the resurrection with our time, our energy, uh, all of that sort of stuff, uh, the more that that reality is going to uh, kind of anchor and navigate our life. And the second is Fridays. Like the church gives us Fridays as a penitential day, a special day to remember the Lord's sacrifice. And to sort of have some little prayer or some little sacrifice on a Friday, like these are just very small, concrete, things the church has been posing for centuries and it's just a matter of, of kind of spending some of the time to, to put him into practice. I think something Pope Benedict as we think about him this is the week that he we were remembering his life and uh, as they were preparing for his funeral here coming on Thursday but he wrote a lot about the importance of Sunday and he said many Christians unfortunately in the western world don't live Sunday they live the weekend. Yeah. Uh, they don't really mark the day of Sunday. Now, we as Catholics know, well, we should go to Mass on Sunday, surely. Isn't that enough? Uh, but I, I think about how many families, I think about when I was a graduate student, uh, we, we would actually just take Sunday off. Like, the, we studied in the evening, but really use the day to have a big feast. We'd make a big brunch and go for a walk, take a nap. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, but it was just times to, like, live leisure and fellowship together. And the way I, I think Pope Benedict didn't quite say it like this, but the point he was making is if someone looked at your life on Sunday, could they tell you were a Christian? When, when I leave pilgrimage is the Holy Land and you, you go there and you're, it's the Sabbath day for the Jews on a, sun, on a Saturday, you, you, you can tell it's Saturday. Things are closed. People are, are strolling. You see families just relaxing. And, uh, and I just wonder if we as Catholics are as good of a witness to our own faith on Sunday or do we live more the weekend? What would be some other things you'd recommend people to do, simple, that they could do just on a Sunday to really mark the day? Yeah, so, you know, for, for college students, I do think, um, like 100%, like the, 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 if you will, the given is, is Sunday Mass. So certainly, so Mass and prioritizing Mass. And then number two is I do think that um, I'm not a brunch guy, but I do think brunch is like kind of like a very Catholic thing and a great way to have like a long brunch with your friends, with your family, you spend a little extra time cooking, whatever it is. I really do think that like celebrating in that way it, with family again is really a kind of an ideal and just sort of like kind of like very concrete and easy starting place. That's great. One thing our family does, I know a lot of families in Focus do this as well, is to have a Lord's Day dinner on, a, on Saturday night. We like to, you know, mark the beginning of the Sabbath. And, you know, so we have like just a simple set of prayers just that's based on some of the biblical prayers of welcoming in the day of the Lord to set it apart. I think that's a great thing to do, but really living Sunday is a great way to begin kind of taking in that Catholic culture more. But let's move on. Uh, we talked about prayer, the importance of relationships, the importance of Catholic culture. A fourth point is simplicity, the Christian call to contentment. Yeah. All right. Tell us about that habit there. Yeah. I think the heart of it is this, is um, as human beings, we have limited resources including our time, our energy, our mental focus, things like that. And so the more things that we have, right, necessarily, we're going to have time and energy acquiring th those things, taking care of those things, using those things, etc. And so if we are kind of spending too much of our time there, uh, just because of uh, sort of the limitedness of our humanity, right, we're going to have less time for a relationship. We're going to have less time, less time for family. We're going to have less time for the Lord. We're going to have less time to do sort of very like 
kind of more healthy things for ourselves. And so that is like kind of a starting point of, of just kind of like looking at your time, your energy, your resources, and how is it that you want to really spend those? You know, and are you prioritizing actually the most important things, the things that are really going to satisfy and fill you? And that that is kind of like the starting place. And then from there, we start to look at concretely sort of like our spending habits, our, our acquisition habits, why we're trying to do X, Y or Z. But in the modern world, Father, you know, we've got these amazing devices called smartphones now. Doesn't that make our lives just so much simpler and easier? I don't think anybody thinks that, you know, and that's part of the mystery of humanity, right? Is it's like. Uh, I know, I know it's, it makes like five things easier, but it also stresses me out all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, uh, I just think that is the human, the human experience. And I love that you said that because I think that is one area of, if you will, like contentment or simplicity, which we can overlook because immediately we can think about like, where am I buying my clothes or this or that? It actually like a contentment and a, sort of a moderation in, in temperance and entertainment is probably actually the most important place and the starting place, but also the hardest place for most people, especially young people these days. Yeah, certainly the amount of time we spend scrolling or just watching videos on YouTube and watching our shows on Netflix and binge watching, I, it, it doesn't leave us happier. Right. You know, I, I, hear, I hear young people tell me this all the time that, I, no, I actually don't feel better, yeah. after, but I keep doing it. What, what advice would you have to a young person to bring greater simplicity, moderation into their their uh, use of their devices? It's a great question and I don't only hesitate because I, I understand how actually difficult this area is for folks because it is something we, we like and we're so kind of wrapped up in. And so I do think some degree of actually like reflection and honesty and a little bit of an examination of like what, how does this make me feel is, is, is like, it's probably the most important starting point. And then number two, I do think I've kind of, I've done a, if, if people are interested in, I have done an Ascension video on this, but like what's kind of trendy now is doing some of these like elimination diets where you like, I'm going to cut out gluten, I'm going to cut out dairy, I'm going to cut out sugar for, for like whatever it is, a few months and slowly introduce them to see how they affect, affect my body or whatever. It's to do that actually with social media. So, okay, if I'm going to cut out Facebook, I'm going to cut out TikTok, I'm going to cut out Instagram, I'm going to cut out this for a certain amount of time. And I'm going to take a reflection now, how do I feel? How's life? And then slowly, if you want to, okay, now I'm going to put back this thing. And to pay attention to, like, what is that doing to my interior? And if it's causing me anxiety and it's causing me all this sort of stuff, like to actually look at it and to be honest and sincere with it and then cut it out. Because again, people are doing that all the time with their physical bodies. Um, but I do think it's worth looking into for kind of like, particularly our media use. Have you heard of this book by Cal Newport that just came out this last year? Cal Newport wrote a book called Digital Minimalism. I have that is it, you should you should read it. Just even the opening chapter, it's just exactly what you're talking yeah. about, of like pulling back for a short period of time, yep. and then intentionally bringing things back in, you know, and and putting limits around that, you know, because yeah. you, when you're too immersed, it's hard to even be able to evaluate well. Right. But I can tell you, I know a lot of focus missionaries. We've uh, a lot of them are senior ones that are like team directors and up. They've committed to do a fast from social media, not getting rid of it, but just do a little bit of fasting. Because yeah. when we fast from wine or a good drink, you know, or a good you know, favorite dessert, we're not saying that those things are bad. We're just trying, I don't want it to have control over me. And so they'll fast like from in the evening hours, because that's when we tend to waste the most time in this space. Yeah. And so that, that'd be one way that we can try to have build more simplicity in a very complex digital world we're in. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. All right. Well. I, I just want to go through quickly a few more of the points here, you know, I, I, but this one I don't want to skip over because it's so important. It's not talked about enough is love for the poor. Christ knocks at your door. So if, Father Mark, you, you have nine points here to talk about the habits that you want to instill to grow in holiness. But number five, love for the poor. Why is that so important, so essential for being a Christian? Yeah, it's essential and important because it's, it's right and just by natural law and because Jesus said so. You know, everything, everything says it. And, uh, you know, Matthew 25, like, he's, he's very clear about the way in which our relationship with the poor is going to be factored in uh, to judgment. And, um, you know, so, so it is. And if you look at the, the way the, our Lord lived, which is the model of our life, right? Like, he had a particular heart for the disenfranchised and those on the fringe and those who are sick and suffering and the poor. And it's an essential component of our faith. 
I think it's one that could be overlooked. Hey, I do a holy hour. I pray the rosary. I'm in a Bible study group. Uh, and I come to conferences. And I listen to Catholic podcasts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but care for the poor. Like, how? Yeah. What, what are some, some practical things you would encourage a young person to, yeah. to incorporate in their life with this? Yeah, I think I think there's there's a lot of ways to look at it. Step one, for a lot of students here, honestly, like a very, very easy step because of the resources available to you are doing like a focused mission trip. I think that's like, an, like a really, really great way to do it. Um, but probably for a lot of people, like, because what we want to do is this. We, if you have a movement, we want to work with the poor. We want to get you to be able to actually put that into practice as soon as possible. And often like volunteering with a homeless shelter or a soup kitchen, youth center, uh, there's like some red tape and there's like a process. And so sometimes like we can try, run into a few obstacles and then we kind of give up. And so I really think is you just get out your phone, look at your phone, who's like one person who could really use a phone call. And if I called them, it like really mean a lot to them and just give them a call and check in. And so that could be grandma or that can be your mom or dad or that can be an uncle or aunt or that could just be a friend at school who you know is struggling. It's just like, it, there's no other cost, there's no other whatever needed. Just pick up your phone, give somebody a call. I think that's a great way to begin. All right, now the next three points, let's do this one all kind of sure. succinctly yeah, yeah, together. Yeah. But by virtue of our baptism, we are incorporated into Christ's three main offices of priest, prophet, and king. And you, you lay this out of, well, what does that mean practically for me as just an ordinary layman? How do I live out that calling and share in Christ's role as priest, prophet, and king? So what would you say about that? Great. And as you said, yeah, by baptism, we share in Christ's role as priest, prophet, and king. And, and the way I, I kind of use these ones, um, so, so the priestly nature is there is, this would be like kind of using like our life of penance and for the laity. And so certainly to, to live a life of sacrifice, uh, particularly... That's just that is part of the Christian life, uh, to offer sacrifice, to do little fastings, little penances um, for ourselves, for the needs of the world, for those around us. So certainly, kind of like, just kind of a, a, a reflection on that and its place in the spiritual life. The, the prophetic nature here, I, I kind of spoke about just giving witness to the Lord. You know, the Lord's moved in our lives, and just kind of like the call to evangelize, to share what we've received. And the kingly nature is, is both in ourselves and in the world, right? To bring order, essentially. All right, we're here with Father Mark Mary Ames, who is the author of this book, Habits for Holiness, Small Steps for Making Big Spiritual Progress. And uh, what we want to do here at this point is we're going to have the chance, if you want to ask a question, uh, they have a microphone right up here, and I don't know if Alejandro's going to work on that. You can ask a question here, and I'll uh, let Father Mark be able to answer that for us. If you want to come right up, you can <laughs> ask a question. I'll also let you know that tomorrow... If any of you have heard of somebody, I don't know if you've heard of him. His name is Father Mike Schmitz. I don't know if you've heard of Father Mike. He's going to be on the show tomorrow, sometime around this time tomorrow as well. You can come check that out. We're going to be talking uh, with Father Mike tomorrow. So if anyone has a question, we can bring it to... This is your moment. All right, here we go. All right, tell us your name and where you're from, and then... All right. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Getman. I'm from a little town called Mitchell, Indiana, in southern Indiana. Um, and my question for Father Mark Mary is, um, how does being a Franciscan inform your habits of holiness? Great question. Thank you. Uh, to be honest, it is like it informs all of it, which is the, the great, the great kind of hopefully reality of the of the book and kind of what I've shared is it's not something that I've made up or figured out, but that. Franciscans in particular have been doing to follow the Lord in the midst of the world for 800 years. And so it is just a proven way uh, to follow the Lord. So that's, that's where it comes from. Thank you. Great question. Excellent. We'll do one more question. If anyone has a question for Father Mark Mary, one more here before we close. Hi, my name is Rachel Eichenberger. I'm from a small town called Lake Stevens in Washington state. Um, my question is, I know I personally have struggles with like discipline and like being um, consistent. How, how would you work or increase your discipline so that you can develop these habits? Great. Yeah, great question, Rachel. And, and I think that is my experience is this, is if I am trying to do something on my own, like I'm, I'm not like super disciplined man, you know, and so and I'm not a morning person, right? So for 13 years, every morning at 6 a.m., I've been in the chapel praying. And why I'm doing that is because my brothers are doing that too. And so that's part of the nature of like, it's a team sport is I do think that with a lot of things in life, the answer 
the answer to the strength I need or the discipline I need isn't just to be better or to be stronger, but actually by bringing somebody else into the situation and allowing their presence and their sort of discipline and their care to actually strengthen my own my own sort of, if you will, like capacities and strengths. So, so generally speaking, for a lot of us, it's just sharing whatever's going on with somebody else and asking them to walk with us in whatever way is appropriate for the situation. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everyone here. So again, this is a special edition of All Things Catholic. We're here at the Seek 23 conference. If you would like to learn more about this podcast, you can text All Things Catholic to 33777. You just pull out your phone and you just put all one word, All Things Catholic to 33777, and you can get the show notes, you'll get the episodes. Uh, podcast comes out every Tuesday, and it's just what I what the name is, All Things Catholic. We cover everything from the spiritual life to marriage, to dating, to the virtues, to the saints, to scripture, apologetics. It's All Things Catholic. You just type that in to 33777 to get the, to get the show there. And if you want to learn more about Father Mark Mary, where did they find you? Uh, I guess you can go to Ascension Press for the books, Ascension Press, Ascension Presents, Spoko Boca Podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. I run our Instagram too, CFR underscore Franciscans, but not if you're struggling with social media. <laughs> no, but that's, yeah, anything where Franciscans are, I'm there, yeah. Excellent. We'll put that in the show notes as well. So thanks so much for being with us, Father Mark. Great to have you. And great to be with all of the people here at the Seek 23 conference. Blessings upon the rest of your week. May you encounter the Lord more profoundly with your, your time at the Seek conference here. Thanks for listening and God bless. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. For more information on the Focus Seek conference, visit seek.focus.org. This episode of the Seek 23 podcast was produced by Spokestreet. For more great podcasts, visit spokestreet.com.